Greetings viewers, Eric the Car Guy here and thank you very much for tuning in today. And I'm excited for you. I'm excited because today is going to be the conclusion of a series of videos that I've been doing with the 2003 Honda Pilot. For those of you not in the know, what I've done up to this point is I've removed the cradle assembly, including the engine and transmission, out of the front of this Pilot. I have serviced the engine, replaced the transmission, reconditioned that subframe, also replaced the entire front suspension, and now it's time to take all of that work that I've done over the past three episodes, well, Four episodes if you want to count the custom-made cart that I made that, well, honestly, it's really worked out. If you've watched the other videos, you know. Anyway, now is the time to take all that work, put it back up into the pilot, and drive it down the road. So before the end of this video, this pilot will drive down the road. I promise you, but I also promise you it won't come without difficulties. There were quite a few things that I ran into along the way. Rather than me sitting here talking about them, why don't you watch the video right now? Let's go. Let's get this drivetrain in here, finally. You might remember that one of those front bolts was a real pain to get out. I just bought four new bolts and there's its part number. Wheels are unlocked. I just needed to kick that and I can move this around. That's the beauty of this whole thing is that I can move it on this cart and get it into position. And that's what I intend to do. So let's see how well I do. That's just crazy. After all this time, after all this work, we're here. pretty good so far. Cleaning out those threads, definitely the way to go because everything's going in super easy. Now to run these in just a little bit. I think that's in there after all this time. <laughs> you perform like a champ. You are worthy. Here's a helpful tip. Now in the back here, you'll see this hole that goes all the way up into the body. That's like the alignment hole for this. And there's one on both sides back here. So if you want to sort of leverage things into place, this is a really good way to do it. Now these aren't completely tightened down yet. I'm about to do that. I'm going to snug them up with my impact, but then I'm going to torque them to 95 foot pounds. That's not cool at all. Well, I'm pretty sure you saw <laughs> then I'm not happy and I'm not happy because this bolt uh, despite the fact that I've cleaned the threads still seems to be having an issue inside of here looks like there's this plate on this corner here I'm gonna remove that see if I can get a look at what's going on inside of here like in the back there seems to be a sleeve that this bolt goes up into and well it's stripped. I need to somehow get in here 
and put some kind of fastener that this will actually hold on to. Otherwise, this subframe is not gonna be held secure and that's just not acceptable. This is what I've been able to come up with. I'm gonna to have to cut into this area, open this thing up and get a look inside. I'm gonna use my plasma cutter to do that. I'm just gonna cut off these areas here, open myself up a window, flip this open and see where it's at. I'm supporting the subframe over on this side. I've got the lift down on its locks. I don't believe there's any danger of anything bad happening. Uh, plus the subframe is still held in by three more fasteners. So the welder stopped working not long ago and now the plasma cutter has stopped working. Yay. So it's quite literally not gonna cut it. I'm gonna try a body saw and see if I can get in there. Open this up and have a look inside. What does that mean that the fastener is up in here? Now I gotta get a look up in here. Okay, so that tube goes all the way up into here. The threads are just stripped out in it. Let's see how far up this extends into that. doesn't extend above it. Before I get into the repair that I'm gonna attempt here, I'm gonna show you the problem, which I don't know if I clearly showed before. And that is when you try and tighten this, it just spins. The threads aren't catching at all. So I can't use this bolt. Now the sleeve on the inside of here is welded in place and it, it's not gonna come out easy. I believe they do it this way, similar to what they did in the back is they fasten the fastener well up into here so that this has the ability to move and stretch a little bit. So I don't wanna compromise that. I, I had a passing thought of cutting this out and just putting a nut on the inside there. I don't think that's the way to go. Here's my solution. Now this is not a grade eight bolt. I couldn't find one locally that is grade eight, but I wanna find at least a grade eight or 10 uh, bolt for this. But this is a half inch bolt and it fits right up through there and like barely fits up through there. So it fits in there snug enough. And then I'm gonna weld a nut to the top for it to screw into. I'll show you over on the vehicle. So the plan is to come in with this replacement bolt, which like I said, just barely fits in here. So it's, it fits pretty snug. I was actually surprised by that. And then up inside of here, I'm gonna weld a nut to the top that this can thread into. I'm gonna start by installing the bolt and threading on the nut. This one is seven inches long. And that was the thing, the grade eight that I found was six inches long and it's too short. I need, I need that extra inch. All right, I think you can just see what I'm gonna be welding right there. I'm just gonna weld that nut to that base right there. The nut that's on here is a grade eight. As I mentioned, I do plan to replace the bolt with a higher grade, probably grade eight. I just gotta special order it. My welding access was limited. But I think that'll work. Let's uh, get this torque to that 95 foot pounds. Before I run this down and give it the final torque, I'm gonna leave it supported by this and I'm gonna close all this up. Because if I put a clamping force on this, like this, and this isn't quite here, or if I go to weld this after the fact, it could be distorted. So this I'm not worried about so much, but this I definitely am. remove some of this paint to make it easier to weld, if I can. Ugly, yes. Effective, also yes. And the biggest reason it's so ugly is because I didn't prep the surface as well as I could have. And then torque this guy to spec. Did that break loose? This is why I left that open. Yep, it broke loose. So I just have to hold it and then I can torque it. I'm grateful that the weld broke. Other than that, I'd be fishing this out of there. So this is why 
I needed grade eight for this. Well, it's not seven inches, but it's seven and a half inches, and that's gonna work. Yay, I was able to find this locally, and I just got back. Now it's time to see if this plan will, well, work. And since this part is already welded, I'm gonna torque it down, and then I'll do the welding the nut into place. We have exceeded our torque, which it's kind of weird about this torque wrench. I usually find myself going past stuff, but it's torque to spec. I don't have to remove it, but just in case I do, it seems welded into place. More importantly, it's torque to spec, which I believe is the most important part, most important part of all this. Now I'm gonna close up that hole and we can resume reassembly. Before I close this up, I'm just gonna hit the inside of it with just a little bit of paint, try and keep the rust away. This is a tool that I got from, uh, well, I can't remember what it was, but some performance thing, but this slips over sheet metal and you can put this in a 3 8 drive and bend it a little bit, which is kind of what I need to do here. It's not quite lining up like I want. So you see how this is sort of buckled out a little bit? Well, I need to bend this whole piece in, and I think this is my best bet to get in there. So I can get in there like that and just bend it up. The closer I can get this back to the original shape, the better. That might work perfectly. I sort of want to tack that into place and sort of massage it a little more. But first, I need to create some clean metal. I'm gonna finish this up by cleaning it up with a wire wheel and then uh, add a little paint. <laughs> we'll get, resume our reassembly. In fact, I probably should have done this before welding, but sometimes changing the bits just gets so hard. Believe me, I cannot wait to reattach that power steering line. It's been doing nothing but dripping and being in the way forever. Yeah, and I don't even care. I'm gonna just gonna paint this with some chassis black. And I'm only going after the welds, nothing more. I'm gonna let that dry for a second. I'm gonna start putting all that back together. While I wait, let's take care of this lingering freaking problem. There we are. It's like it never happened. What happened? I don't know. I didn't lose half a day on that. No, no. I need to get this back together. And to do that, I'm gonna to need to save some time, which means I'm not gonna walk you through every single step. It's pretty much the opposite of removal, which was covered in earlier videos. So, you get a time lapse. You're welcome. We're pretty much there. Now that the transmission cooler has been completely installed, I just need to get my battery tray in here, uh, reconnect or reattach the ABS like that, and you know, throttle cables and a few other things. So I'm gonna do that and then we'll check back in when I'm done. And I'll let you know if I had any issues.
Something I didn't cover during the time lapse was the installation of the stabilizer links. And you should be looking at the part number on your screen. That's a pair of them. So all you need is this part number. You don't need two of these like I did and I ended up with extras. Anyway, all you need is one bag of these things and it works for both sides. Something else you've made notice during the time lapse is I replaced these upper bolts on the struts with cam bolts that I got from Aerogenics. I will link that down in the description, make it easy for you to find. What this will allow me to do is make camber adjustments on the front where there was none before so I can really dial in the front alignment. So my alignment guy is going to be happy to see these. This is one of the old clips from the old negative battery cable, which I'm just going to slip over this and use it to hold it to one of its former clips. You have this giant cover, heat shield. Well, I am going to trim this down. It's a new battery and I've already cleaned the terminals, but if you have an older battery, probably not a bad idea to do that. Clean the terminals, that is. Here are the battery terminals that I'm using. I'm gonna link these in the description, but I'm gonna add one more thing. And what this is, this is gonna be a switch for my ground. So if I undo this, th then there is no ground. And if I run that down, there is a ground. So this attaches and, well, connects and disconnects the battery ground. And this will become important later on. So you're gonna go there, you're gonna go there. And for the grand finale, the hold down. Now this does have an arrow on it that points to the front. I don't care as much about covering the ground side, but I do care about covering the positive side. And there's the finished product. I think it turned out rather well and I'll be able to connect and disconnect the ground right there. I'm gonna install the front wheels. This will help me orientate them so that I can reconnect the steering column. I wanna make sure that I can get things straight. Also, I'll be able to move this back so it'll make plugging in the computer easier because that's like the last thing I need to do. And I replace that stud. I have an almost endless supply of spare lug nuts from years of working at the dealer and installing wheel locks. For every set of wheel locks, I got four new lug nuts because uh, I'd remove them. And then I'd throw them in a bucket for a day, just like today. Not torquing these yet. These wheels are coming off a couple of times before this is all said and done. When I put this on the road for the final time, then I'll worry about the wheel torque. For now, I'm just putting the wheels on. Steering wheel holder is still intact, which is great. And I believe the wheels to be straight. So that means all I should have to do is drop this down on here. I'm really pleased with how easily that went. I'm just gonna run that down finger tight. That's all it really needs to be for now. It's got like a rounded spot on the shaft so it can't come back up off of here. But just in case this isn't lined up well, I'll be able to pop it off and put it back on. But now, turn our attention to these computer wires. And these connectors only go in to one place. So even though I'm doing this blind, I'm pretty confident stuff's going where it's supposed to. That's the computer hooked up and also the steering column. I just need to reconnect the ground and well, we should be able to fire it up. Coolant is filled up. I'm ready to bleed the system. Also, I have a funnel in the power steering fluid, which I know I'm going to add more of. Um, that tends to make noise. I want to make sure that's quiet. I have uh, oil in the engine, also oil in the transmission, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to have to top both of these off 
anytime you do this significant amount of work, you really want to keep an eye on that. All I'm really intent on doing here is starting it up, letting it normalize, bleeding out the cooling system, and then I'll recheck all the fluids, and then we'll tighten some stuff up, and then I believe we can go for a test drive. Negative cable. All right, people. It's been, oh geez, probably about, it's at least a month, maybe even five to six weeks. Actually, before I start it up, I'm gonna see what I can do to adjust that uh, switch for the transmission to make sure that that's aligned correctly. So before I start it up, I'm gonna do that. So that's in park. Reverse neutral. Right where it is, seems to be a good spot. Now that I've cycled the key, I can check around the fuel pressure regulator and things and see if there are any leaks, which there aren't any. Fuel leaks would be a major concern, obviously. I can just quickly sneak under here. The switch is literally right here. Tighten it down. No more dallying. Let's start it up. Check engine lights on. And it seems to be idling kind of high. Get that power steering fluid in there. I was tapping on the idle air control valve. It seemed to be making things idle kind of high and I remember cleaning it out. It might have just, the blade might have got a little stuck and tapping on it can loosen it up. And that may be the source of our check engine light. It might have been saying, hey, wait a minute, why are you on full idle? Or why are you opened all the way up? Well, that's way better. Best tool in the box right there. No leaks to speak of nothing significant that I can see anyway. That's fantastic. This thing idles pretty stinking good though. Cooling fans are on. So that cooling system's bled out. Now I'll turn the wheel from lock to lock. For the power steering system. got good heat so the cooling system is sorted that fluid level looks fine I'm just gonna put the cap on we'll keep an eye on it now I'm gonna shut it off and check the rest of those fluids I haven't run the transmission through the gears yet so I know that this won't be accurate but I do want to be sure that it's full yeah it needs needs a little bit That also needs about a half a quart, or maybe a quart. Remember, I only finger tighten the uh, sensor on top of the transmission so I can do exactly this. I'm using the transmission fluid that was provided to me by Go Powertrain, and it appears this Endometsu is the OE supplier for Honda. So if you can find this stuff, maybe it's cheaper than the Honda stuff, I'm not sure. Now with transmissions, only add a half a quart at a time and creep up on it, because overfilling, oh, that's not good. You're much better at underfilling and then creeping up on it. Still really nothing on the stick. And Honda transmissions you check at operating temperature on a level surface with the engine off, not running, off. Still nothing registers. That was just one quart. Just down above that bottom dot. I'm only gonna add about a quarter of a quart more. As long as you're between those two dots, you're fine. That just might be how I fill these transmissions from here on out, because trying to get that hose out of where the old fill plug was can be a pain in the butt. But the fact that I've removed this a couple of times, and by the way, they 
furnished me with a new o-ring that I used uh, on this speed sensor when I installed it. Now I'm gonna pull it forward and backward a little bit so that the suspension settles out and then I'm gonna tighten all the fasteners that hold the lower control arms in. Also, I want to uh, get my cam bolts and all that stuff sorted and tightened down as well. Well, I think I know why the uh, brake sensor was unplugged. I pulled the codes and I'm not excited about what I found. So O2 sensor, low circuit, low volts. I guess that's sensor one. So the primary sensor, the one that's difficult to replace. And the second one is for throttle pedal, pedal position sensor, low input. I'm gonna try clearing these codes and see if they come back. Immediately. <laughs> So it's just a throttle pedal position sensor. This is the throttle position sensor here up on the throttle body. And I unplugged it and tried to see if like maybe there was some gunk or something that got down in there or maybe it wasn't plugged in completely, but it's plugged in. And uh, well, the way to replace this is to replace the throttle body. It's not a replaceable sensor. So I'm, uh, well, gonna test it or see what I can figure out about this. Maybe tap on it with the hammer. That seemed to work before. Let's see if I can get that code to go away. None of the wiggling, jiggling, and tapping had any effect. So there's something going on with this TPS that I need to look into. Well, I've busted out my more sophisticated scan tool, which can read live data. And, uh, well, it says that the throttle position sensor is at 1%. And I can just move the throttle here and nothing's happening. It just stays at 1%. This is just like stepping on the accelerator pedal inside the vehicle. As I move the throttle, this signal should change. Since this still could be an issue with the wiring, I have my uh, voltmeter hooked up, set for 12 volts. I have, uh, well, 12.1 volts at the battery. Anyway, the other lead is connected to the ground. There are three terminals here, and the center is signal, and then the outer ones, one is ground and one is power. So. On one of these, I should see about five volts for the reference voltage, which is this one. So I've got reference voltage going to it. The signal, 0.06 volts, and then the ground was 0.01. So the ground's, it's, it's getting everything it should get. It's just not sending a signal back no matter what I do. So it has what it needs. It has ground, it has five volt reference, but nothing is happening when you move the sensor. So. That sensor is bad. Well, viewers, I have had one heck of a morning, but the new throttle body is installed, which has a new throttle position sensor, but this was not without difficulty. Oh no, no, no. This is why I had a heck of a morning. So I wanted to clean out the idle air control valve in the same way that I did with the previous throttle body. Uh, you might remember that I removed this from the throttle body and cleaned it out to, well, in an effort to try to make it idle a little bit smoother. I also cleaned out everything else. Well, in the process of removing these screws, and this is not uncommon, but in the process of removing these screws, I broke one. A little bit was still sticking up, so I tried to get that out and I broke that too. And then I tried several times to weld a nut to the top of what was left to try and get it out. Finally ended up drilling this thing. Uh, after doing that, I tried to run a tap through it and then I broke my tap inside of here. Like, <laughs> like I said, it's been a heck of a morning. Then it took, well, <laughs> quite a bit of hammering and beating in order to get that thing back out. I ended up drilling this out larger so that I could accept a bolt instead of a screw like this. Thing is, this little shoulder here was sort of in the way, so I had to sort of trim that down in order to get the bolt and everything to work. Anyway, the uh, idle air control valve has been mounted on the new throttle body and everything, well, is sealed up and should be working. We can come over here to the vehicle and see, check it out. I've got a reading on my throttle position sensor and when I move it, it changes. Look at that. That's what's supposed to happen. Now, weirdly, it only goes from 10 to 90%. And I'm not sure if it's doing that. And I have made sure that it's closed. There's no more closing. So I'm not exactly sure about that. That might be something, some discrepancy between this tool and the computer on the vehicle, not sure. But let's start it up for the first time, see how it idles and see how it does.
Yay, it works like it's supposed to now. Once it warms up, I suspect the auto will come down. All right, I've cleared the codes and it's warmed up. <laughs> it's running really good now, as you can hear. Best part though, no more check engine light at all. There's just that seatbelt light and I can turn the maintenance light off. Well, viewers, after all that time, after all that work, after three previous videos, well, four now that you've watched this one, we are at the point where we are driving the 2003 Honda Pilot down the road. It's moving under its own power and it's awesome. And I've got to admit, while this isn't exactly right after I finished the work, I've driven it about 60 miles, which has given me a chance to get to know the vehicle and make sure that everything is cool. Uh, one of the things that I'm very happy about is the fact that there are no check engine lights, no lights, no adverse lights on the dash whatsoever. That may be my favorite part of all of this. It runs and drives like it's a brand new 2003 Honda Pilot. And I'm proud of that because that's kind of what I was going for. I wanted to give this thing everything that I possibly could and make it run and drive as good as I possibly could. And I can say that, well, it's not just my opinion, but when I took this in for the alignment, the alignment guy took it out for a drive. And when he came back, he says, that's the best running and driving Honda Pilot that I've been in in years. And he's been around, so I take that as a high compliment. A lot of you have been asking me, Eric, how much is all this work costing? Isn't this more than the vehicle is worth? Absolutely, yes. And in fact, that's kind of part of my point of doing all this. And that point is buying a used SUV is not a good idea because it's most likely going to be a money pit. Now, when all is said and done, I plan to do a video about how much all of this cost. But for now, for round numbers, just if I could throw out a guess to how much the work that I just finished in this series, I'm going to say somewhere between five and six thousand dollars. Remember, I replaced that transmission and those remanufactured transmissions from Go Powertrain don't come cheap. But in my mind, they're worth every penny because you do it once and you're done. This thing shifts great. It drives great. Now, circling back to a couple of things, uh, when I replaced the throttle body, I put on a new gasket at that time. And you might remember in a previous episode when I removed it where that got torn a little bit. Well, I was in there, so I just put a new gasket in. Speaking of that throttle position sensor, I have zero explanation for why it reads 10% closed and 90% wide open throttle. As far as the vehicle's concerned, there are no check engine lights, no anything. The transmission is shifting, as I said, excellent. There are no indications that there's a problem whatsoever. So I, I have no explanation for why that was reading that way. The only thing I can think to do is find another 2003 Honda Pilot, plug into it and look at the throttle position sensor readings and see if it's the same. If it is, well, then I can say that that's normal. I just hate not having like good information, especially from the tools that are supposed to be giving me good information. Also, the brake light that was on on the dash. I took care of that by replacing the brake fluid reservoir cap and I plugged that in and now that brake light is off. So again, no lights on the dash, runs and drives awesome, like awesome. And with the new tires, new suspension, engine transmission, it's, it's fantastic. In fact, you can sit and just listen to it idle and it's like, it's like I said, it's like brand new. I will be doing separate videos on the installation of the transmission cooler and also the installation of the fog lights. So those videos will be covered separately. You might have noticed that those things happened along the way. I'll also link in the description uh, the other videos in this series for this pilot. In fact, I've done a whole series of videos. This is the ETCG Hackhawk series. And the reason why it's the Hackhawk is because when I'm done with all this work, my intentions are to mount a supercharger on top of that engine. Well. We'll see what happens. Parts, tools, additional information, all linked down in the description, so check there if you have questions. If you have automotive questions I didn't cover, ericthecarguy.com will also be linked in that description uh, for you to go to and hopefully get help with those issues that you're having. Thank you so much for watching today. Thank you for watching this series. I hope you had as much fun watching as I had fun making this. I did a lot of cool things in this series. Uh, go back and watch it again. Be safe, have fun, stay dirty. I will see you next time. And remember, I post videos on Friday, so that will be next time. Also, hit the notifications after you subscribe so that you know when I post new videos. See ya.